All right. Testing. Three point one four one five nine. Some people say I lisp, but I seldom observe it, unless I say figure or spice or some such valuable substance as stew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now I hear you. Now you hear me. All right, good. Okay. Well, Mike, thank you for sharing, and because I just want to say to all of you, uh, please pray for Mike and his wife. I mean that they would get more opportunities, uh, but also. I mean, this is going to be a challenging time for them, so uh, please, uh, let's hold them up in prayer uh, throughout the next many weeks. Okay, uh, quick report. Uh, we've been really busy at Reasons to Believe because this past week we've had the lab, which is basically high school and college students who want to pursue a career in science or engineering. Uh, they spend several days with our scientific team to get ready for a future career where they can use their science as a tool to bring people of faith in Christ. Because we just heard uh, from Tim how a lot of people in science, they just focus on their science, they really don't integrate their faith. So that's, that's what this was all about. And Kathy and I spent most of our time with the parents, because we also had the parents come. Because, uh, you know, it's a challenge uh, when your son or daughter wants to pursue a PhD and go on and uh, become a researcher and uh, you don't have any science background, how do you basically work in that relationship? So we shared with them. But uh, one of the, uh, quote, parents I found out was not a parent. Uh, he's from Cincinnati, a businessman in Cincinnati, an engineer there. And uh, he had two boys. He said, neither one of them are my sons. I bribed them to come to the lab. And I says, what do you mean? He says, well, this young man, uh, he's an atheist and his friend is a lapsed Catholic. Uh, but I felt that they could come to the lab that might turn their life around. And I bribed them by saying, if you go to the lab, I'll take you through two days surfing. And you know, they're from Cincinnati. There's not a whole lot of good surfing in the Cincinnati area. So I said, well, are you a surfer? He says, no, can you tell me what at the good surfing beaches are? So I tried to give him some tips for the places to go to surf and where you can start and then uh, get a little more excitement. Uh, from the waves there. So the two boys were really excited about the surfing. But I talked to them towards the end of the lab and they were really excited about what they were learning. And so uh, they just said, you know, can we have an hour and a half of your time just to ask questions? And it's interesting, this one young man labeled himself an atheist, but I can't remember seeing anybody more spiritually hungry than this young man who was asking all the right questions and uh, very receptive to what I was hearing. And uh, he actually started reading why the universe is the way it is. And I said, well, how far are you going? He said, just through the t first two chapters. But he says, my big questions are on the problem of evil. And I said, well, you need to get to chapters 12, 13, and 14, because that's really where we talk about how God designed the physics of the universe as a way to permanently eliminate evil while enhancing human free will. He says, that what the book is all about? That's the big question I got. So uh, he was really excited about that. And then talking to the uh, lapsed Catholic, and what I found is that both of these young men uh, have been attending church, have stopped going to church, and I said, well, what was your experience? They said, we go to church, <coughs> we sing a few dumb songs, somebody gets up and speaks for 20 minutes, and we all leave, and the 20-minute message, we learn nothing. And I said, it's like, why go to church? So we both stopped going. But I said, if church was like this, we'd be here every Sunday. And I said, well, that's what church is supposed to be like. It's supposed to be a place where you can ask questions, where you can get into deep dialogue and discussion about the most important issues of life. And I said, well, that's what we thought too. I said, every church we tried is like that wasn't going on at all. And so I shared with them just how in my ministry with pastors, any church where they close the sermon out, uh, where the pastor, or particularly where they have people come up and help, have an open mic Q&A where any question is welcome, and they deal with the question. If they can't deal with it, they form a discussion group, a research group. Every church I know that does that is a church that's growing by adult converts. And so when I go out and speak, that's basically what I try to do when I'm speaking at church is saying, you need to think about and it doesn't have to be, quote, right after the sermon in the sanctuary, but 
take them out to a meeting room. And I've been in churches like that where I give the sermon and then immediately we go to a room where people can ask questions, uh, typically for a couple of hours while they eat their lunch. And it's like, again, every church that does that, they're growing by adult converts. And typically churches where they sing a few dumb songs, 20 minute message, everybody leaves. Uh, those are churches that obviously are declining. But it was sad to me to learn that here are these two young men, both very spiritually hungry, and yet going to church, talking to Christians. And basically one of them said, yeah, uh, in my Catholic church, uh, we get disciplined if we ask questions. I mean, we're basically told not to ask questions. So it's like, and that's not the way the New Testament reads, is it? So, and that's one reason why in this class, I let people interrupt me with questions anytime. And like last week, we kind of caught off topic, didn't we? And so, <clears throat> well, that's why I got this up here. I didn't have, my computer's got problems, and I won't mention who it is, but there's an individual in this class that saw my problems and says, you got some hardware issues with your VGA connection, and I am making it work with another projector. These projectors wouldn't work, that one does. But that's supposed to be yellow, not red. So, and those are supposed to be stars in the background, and as you can see, so, uh, but yeah, uh, someone in the class stepped up and said, hey, Hugh, I'm going to buy you a new computer. And this one is a little out of date. You know what? The computer I'm going to get is going to make me a lot more productive. I mean, it's got, it's, I didn't realize how many advances have been made. So I'm actually going to be able to write books faster. So <laughs> praise the Lord. This is great. So maybe it was God's will that I had these technical issues. I don't know. So, uh, uh, but hey, I want to launch off. Yeah, go ahead. Um, <coughs> I think in some churches, it's like they wait asking questions like you're questioning God. You know, I just think maybe that's part of it. You know? Right. But when you read the Psalms, what do you see? It's David questioning God all the time. He complains to God and says, why are you doing this? But notice how God would answer uh, David's questions. And David was persistent with his questions. So that's why he called David a man after my own heart. He's not afraid to come to me with the tough questions. God wants us to ask the tough questions. And he wants us to deal with the tough questions. And I appreciate what Ross said here. Isn't church a place where you're supposed to talk about the difficult issues, the issues that bring conflict and controversy? Yes, it is. It is. And my passion is I wish these Christian universities would stop trying to, you know, let's not rock the boat, let's not have any waves. A Christian university is where you're supposed to deal uh, with the waves. Okay, thank you. That's causing an issue. Okay. Let me just pull that down so it doesn't interfere. Okay. Yes. I, I want to know if, it's, if I'm correct or not. The word Israel means with God. Right. Yeah. Yep. And that story you see in Genesis where Jacob wrestles with God. And a lot of people think, well, okay, his hip was put at a joint, uh, that uh, he was actually involved in a physical wrestle with God. But if you read that text in Genesis, uh, it was a spiritual wrestle. Because the day before, Jacob heard news, your brother is coming, and he's got 400 armed men with him. And it's like, okay, my brother's going to do me in. And, you know, how am I going to be able to approach my brother? And what you notice is, after Jacob stood up all night, praying with God and begging God, look, I need to figure out a way to deal with my brother whom I cheated. And uh, you've got to give me some insight. You, prom you made these promises to me. How is this going to be fulfilled? And here's Jacob in the morning, having spent the entire night in prayer wrestling with God over these spiritual issues, and now he's got God's plan on how to deal with his brother. His brother's got a physical focus. If you read the story, what he does is he sends out uh, different portions of his flock, one at a time. So he wasn't just giving one bribe to his brother, it was multiple bribes over a period of time with a message that went with each gift that he gave uh, to uh, uh, Jacob. And then notice when Jacob and Esau meet, 
Esau tries to give the gifts back. He was testing his brother. My brother stole from me. Now he's trying to bribe me. And notice how Jacob wisely deals with the offer to return the gifts. He says, no, my brother, uh, this is a blessing from God that I want to share with you. And that's when there is reconciliation. But it took all night of praying. So a question I've got with you, have you ever had a crisis in your life? where he basically said, okay, I need to spend the night in prayer. And you notice that in Paul's life in the book of Acts, he called it a watch. A watch is kind of like a fast. Uh, when we fast, we stop eating food, but there's another kind of fast where you don't sleep. And instead of sleeping, you spend that entire time in prayer, but typically about a crisis issue in your life, some kind of spiritual crisis. I think it's important that all of us uh, you know, when we face that kind of a crisis, think about celebrating that with a watch. Yes. Yeah, if the uh, if that struggle with God that <coughs> for Jacob was spiritual rather than physical, how did the uh, touching the hip and the lameness get into that? Well, a lot of scholars looked at that and said, you know, that was kind <coughs> of God giving uh, a symbol uh, to Jacob, basically telling, him, okay, you've wrestled with God, and hey, so. Uh, and God often does that. Uh, when there's a spiritual breakthrough, he gives a physical sign. I mean, you see that throughout the uh, Old Testament. Uh, when the flood's over, there's the rainbow. Now, you know, Noah's seen rainbows before, but God says that rainbow is a sign that uh, my spiritual covenant with you is going to hold. So it's kind of like a sign, okay, now that your hip is at a joint, don't worry about your brother. And he was limping. I don't think he uh, maintained that limp. Because it looks like he got better. And so, uh, I don't know how long he was limping. Uh, but, and who knows. When he was wrestling with God. You know, when I've had those kinds of moments where I prayed all night. Uh, I was tossing and turning. He may have tossed and turned the wrong way. Who knows. <laughs> uh, I don't know exactly. I mean, all of it, we're not given a lot of detail in scripture. But I think it's quite clear based on the consequences. What we see there. It was a spiritual wrestling match not a physical wrestling match. Because the spiritual, the result was a spiritual benefit. Okay. Before we jump into Isaiah, uh, this is, I'll keep this short, uh, but it's a paper that got published in the July issue. And it's interesting, the scientific literature, they actually had, they released the July journal before it's actually July. Uh, so, we're actually getting something from the future here, right? <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, this just got published literally uh, days ago uh, in the journal Animal Behavior. Uh, I do read outside my discipline. And uh, it's a t an experiment done for the first time on puppies. We're talking dogs. And uh, they've noticed in previous research that adult dogs that are bonded to a human being uh, will respond uh, to human cues and training. But they said, I wonder if this is true of very young dogs. So it was like 40 dogs that were just eight weeks old. Puppies. Puppies, yeah. <laughs> I mean, really young puppies. Not even weaned yet from their mothers. And what they noticed with very young puppies they will respond to training from the mother. And these are all cases where the mother was present. So these were not puppies that were taken from their mother. The mother was still there. But what they noticed was these young puppies would take cues from the mother on how to avoid danger. So these are basically puppies coming to something strange they hadn't seen before and kind of looking over to their mother uh, dog. Is it this okay or should I back up? And the mother kind of gives a cue uh, to the young puppy, no, this is safe, go ahead and explore it. Or no, you better back away, this is something that could harm you. And this is true of all um, mammals, that's how the mothers basically uh, train uh, their young. But what they notice in this case is that they could substitute a human being for the mother, even at eight weeks old. Uh, as long as the human has had some social contact with the puppy, doesn't have to be as much as the mother, but just some social contact uh, with the puppy, the puppy will also take cues 
from the human. A dog will really look to the human, is this okay for me to explore or not? And so this experiment basically says these eight-week-old puppies will respond to a human they've had social contact with in the same way they will a mother. And they also did a test with other dogs. So in other words, a strange adult dog. And what they noticed was with a strange adult dog, nothing happens. It only works with a mother or uh, a human being that has had social contact with a dog. They said, why are you talking about this in class? Well, if you see my book over there, Hidden Treasures in the Book of Job, it makes the point in the Book of Job that God designed these birds and mammals to bond to members of their own species and to serve and please members of their own species, but simultaneously to do the same thing with human beings. And they do it with humans, but they don't do it with other animals. Uh, they'll do it with uh, members of their own species where they have an emotional bond, but not with those that don't. But they'll do it with humans where there's an emotional bond as well. Uh, and the book of Job is replete with the point God created these animals, birds and mammals, to serve and please us, to emotionally bond to us, to take cues from us, to be, take commands from us. I mean, they'll literally listen to our commands. Well, some of our pets do. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> and making the point to notice that God designed them to serve and please and relate to a higher species. And uh, it takes a higher species to train them. Likewise, we are uh, designed to serve and please a higher being, uh, to relate to the higher being. And the book of Job ends, chapter 42 where uh, God says to Job and his friends, you've been able to tame every species of bird and mammal. You've even been able to tame the hippopotamus. You've even been able to tame the Nile crocodile. There's a few of the reptiles <coughs> that also are nephesh creatures. As difficult as they are to tame, but there's one species of mammals that you can't tame. You cannot tame a fellow human being. It takes me, a higher being, to bring humility to a proud human being. So, take a lesson from these animals. You need to come to me. Okay, a little off the topic, but uh, that's this paper in uh, animal behavior. Okay. You yes. Let me just say one thing that I forgot to say while I was up there. I'm sorry. Um, there is, for those of you who are members of the church, there is a meeting at 12. At so 12? At 12. So Hugh's going to be here till 12.15, but if at 5 to 12 you feel the need to go over there, it's fine. You just need to get up and go, go do that. So Thank you. I meant to make that announcement because, yeah. yeah, at 12 o'clock there is a, a, a congregational meeting and they will need a quorum there. So they need at least a few of you here to go over there and be part of that quorum. And uh, it won't offend me at all. Incidentally, I'm going to end my teaching at 12 noon. I'll stick around for Q&A afterwards. Uh, but at 12, I'll end my teaching. So you're not going to miss any of the teaching. And yeah, you're welcome to stay. But if you want to exit and go to the meetings just around the corner, uh, we'll make that happen for you. OK. Well, I was thinking, you know, um, there probably are people that can't be tamed. God allows them to stubbornly have that free will. like. Joseph Stalin or someone like that. And that kind of is one of the things that distinguishes us from the animal kingdom, don't you think? Well, the message you see in Job 42 is that none of us will get the humility we need to come into relationship with God unless we're prepared to be tamed by God. I mean, that's part of the salvation path. Right. And uh, basically, he was exhorting Job's three friends, you need to come to me. And he had Job pray for them. Uh, that they would do that very thing. And every indication is that they did. Uh, but if you look at the whole debate, that's kind of the difference between Job and his three friends. But I do think Elihu was on the right track. And notice God was talking about the three friends, not Elihu. So Elihu uh, demonstrated uh, the humility uh, to come these, to God. You hear these people that, that say that mankind is no different than any other animal, just we're higher. Well, you know, that debate I had with Peter Atkins a couple of weeks ago in London, I mean, that was his approach. 
We humans are just sophisticated animals. There's really no <coughs> distinction between us and the animals. The Book of Job is written to make that point. There is a difference. There are similarities because God obviously designed these birds and mammals to relate to us. So of course they have to have emotions, otherwise we're not going to be able to bond with them at an emotional level. So nat naturally we've got some similarities. These animals have mind, will, and emotions, but they lack the spirit. Uh, they lack uh, the capacity to engage in philosophy. They lack the capacity to engage in symbolic communication. And this is something that our team at Reasons to Believe is writing on, because there's a lot of new literature. And incidentally, what amazes me is that the biological research community really didn't do any research on looking at the symbolic capabilities of animals versus humans until eight years ago. First time that was done, the paper that was published had the title, Darwin's Mistake. Because it was Darwin who made the point, we humans are only differing from the animals by degree, not fundamentally in kind. And Darwin actually proposed experiments to test his hypothesis. Wasn't done until eight years ago. Now there's a whole bunch of papers out basically making a point. We are unique in our symbolic capabilities. Uh, you know, people claim, well, there's a horse that can do basic arithmetic. And uh, what the, you know, because there's actually a horse out there uh, where the owners say, okay, what's three plus four? And the horse will take his hoof and do it seven times. And, you know, could do all kinds of simple arithmetic that way. Is his name Mr. Ed? <laughs> wasn't Mr. Ed. <laughs> I think you're dating yourself with that one. <laughs> but yeah, what they found, there was a research paper done where they basically discovered what was going on was a horse was looking for emotional cues from the owner. And so basically what happened is a horse would be doing this and the owner would be doing this, and when the owner stopped, the horse stopped. <laughs> or when the owner changed his facial expression, the horse would stop. So what they did is they put a stranger in there uh, that deadpanned the thing, and the horse couldn't do any arithmetic at all. Couldn't even do one plus one. So, uh, Those papers are peer-reviewed secular They're in peer-reviewed secular literature, and what they're basically pointing out, only humans can develop a number system. Only humans can develop an alphabet and be able to communicate in sentences and paragraphs. Yes, there are animals that can develop a so-called vocabulary, you know, like parrots. Uh, they will, you know, repeat sentences. Uh, but you don't see parrots using words to come up with original <coughs> thought expressions. That's unique to human beings. They simply repeat what we're saying, sometimes to a great <coughs> embarrassment. So, uh, yes. Coco the gorilla just passed away, age 46. Who did? Coco the gorilla. Coco the gorilla. I think uh, Coco had a vocabulary size of a little more than 200 words. 2,000. 2,000 words? Yeah. Okay, but here's the, uh, the, the caveat. Coco had a human trainer that spent hours per day, and it took 20 years to get the vocabulary size up to 200, then it got a little higher. So, but Coco is not able to form an original sentence or paragraph. Can't do it. That's unique to human beings. And humans are the ones that can develop a vocabulary of tens of thousands of words. And it's because of our ability to develop complex language and symbolic communication that we're able to advance technology. That's one thing that are discovering with the Neanderthals, <coughs> with Homo erectus, with all the Homo species except for ours. And incidentally, it's a mistake to refer to humans as Homo sapiens. That's a broad term that includes the Neanderthals and a whole lot of other <laughs> bipedal primate species. We are Homo sapiens sapiens, which means we think twice. Okay. <laughs> Not always, okay. Uh, but yeah, that's what separates humans from all the bipedal primates that preceded us. We alone have this symbolic capability. We alone are able to advance our technology. Because yeah, you got Neanderthals around for 100,000 years. The technology at the end is the same as the technology at the beginning. 
although there is one paper published where they said we see this uh, looks like this tool beside this Neanderthal that looks more complex than what I had before but it overlaps the human era and uh, we already know from primates that share uh, the natural world with us now they steal our tools that's one of the things we notice about the more advanced primates they are thieves uh, you ever had a pet monkey you know what I'm talking about uh, they will steal anything from you they don't necessarily use it but they will steal it so matter of fact when I was in Japan I ran across this uh, uh, group is about 200 of these uh, Japanese monkeys up in the mountains and what's interesting about these monkeys each one had an empty coke can in their hand <laughs> <laughs> and they wouldn't let go of that coke can I mean here they're trying to run across uh, this highway to the, the forest above us and none of them would ever let go of that coke can uh, they weren't using it but they were hanging on to it <laughs> And it was really funny seeing 200 monkeys all with an empty coat <laughs> can in their, in their hand. Yeah, our uh, conure uh, parrot, uh, she loves to play with things that we can play with. Yeah. Our yeah. Well, I think it's what's happening to monkeys. They see humans drinking coke and, well, it's got to be good, they grab it. So, okay. Over here, and then we're going to get into the book of Isaiah. Go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, there, there are lots of things that were written about nature of man by the Greeks that said we had two, two parts. We had uh, a body uh, or, or, and we had a uh, soul right. or a mind. Uh, and they didn't find the third part, but it says in scripture that when you become a new creature in Christ, that the spirit comes to dwell within you. And I don't know whether it just means we're reconnected to our spirit, but that spirit nature is uh, something that kind of is identified with, with being a Christian because it says he'll, he'll lead you and he'll guide you and, and he'll be a friend and everything. So perhaps that spirit nature isn't really measurable with science. Uh, yeah, what that text is saying is that the spirit within us at the point of salvation bonds with the spirit of God. Yeah. And the spirit of God permanently indwells us. We are spirit beings from the time we were conceived. You'll see that in Psalm 51 and in Psalm 139, which is why, based on the Old <coughs> Testament, we recognize that taking the life of the fetus is murder because we are spirit beings from the point of conception. So That's when the spirit comes within us. Would that be uh, the fact with Adam and Eve then, that they were created with the spirit? They were created as spiritual beings, whereas the Neanderthals they had mind, will, and emotions, but they lacked the spirit. And, you know, one of the people who was here for the lab was, our, uh, was a paleoanthropologist, Sue Dykes. She got her PhD at Witzwatersand University in South Africa, which is the world's leading institution when it comes to paleoanthropology. She was the only Christian there, uh, but she was giving these brilliant talks about how when you look at the quote, the evolution in these bipedal primates, it doesn't follow a linear path. Uh, some of the latest species of bipedal primates have the smallest brains and the least capability of bipedal motion. So it's all chaotic. The one thing that ties it together is that it's clear, uh, and what I find ironic, this was first published by uh, the atheist anthropologist uh, Ian Tattersall. He says, one of the things we note about these bipedal primates, they're absent from Australia and from South America and probably also absent from North America. They were there in complete abundance in Africa, especially Sub-Sahara Africa, and to a lesser degree Asia and a slightly lesser degree Europe. He says, <coughs> notice there's a direct correlation between the presence of these bipedal primates the diversity of the species of these bipedal primates and how many bird and mammal species of large size were wiped out by subsequent human beings. So for example, when humans came into Australia, they quickly drove to extinction 94% of all the large bodied bird and mammal species. Consequently, the Aborigines remain in a Stone Age technology with a very small population. They killed off the animals that we see mentioned in the book of Job. 
that God says we need for <coughs> large civilization. The animals he specially created for us to do that very thing. <coughs> Whereas in sub-Sahara Africa, the extinction rate when humans came into that region was only 4.5%. And in sub-Sahara Africa, we now have documented at least 10 distinct species of bipedal primates that preceded human beings. Basically, what Ian Tattersall is suggesting is that we have these beings, tall bipedal beings, that had capability of using weapons and basically trained the birds and mammals. When you see a tall bipedal with a weapon in his hand, don't go towards that person, run away. Uh, so, and that's kind of what happened when humans came into North and South America. The animals are designed to come to us, to relate to us. And when they did, they got killed off. So, but God, and that's how we, we incorporate Eden Tattersall's uh, hypothesis into our book, Who is uh, Adam? Basically saying, it's God that created these bipedal primate species and used them as a way to step-by-step -step train the large-bodied bird mammal species. Uh, you need to avoid bipedals with weapons in their hands. Because uh, God knew we humans would sin in the Garden of Eden. Yes? Even, uh, I believe you said that uh, the Sioux Dykes were showing that in the more recent uh, bipedal primates uh, preceding the modern, that the progression of brain size and mobility uh, was not necessarily linear Correct. from simple to complex. Could that also apply to primates early, like Australopithecines, etc., or is it just limited to the uh, more recent to bipedal primates, up to how far back? Well, I would love it if Sue could actually give a talk here in the class, uh, but I did get to hear one of her lectures, and she talked about the two most recent finds of bipedal primates, where they're able to recover about two-thirds of the skeleton, which means he actually knew. Because uh, she says for a lot of these bipedal primate uh, uh, species they've identified, it's based just on the skull structure. They don't have the rest of the uh, skeleton. So they just assume that if they have a relatively advanced skull, that means they were fully bipedal. She says, well, they've actually found one that had an advanced skull, uh, but didn't have the bipedal capability. And basically these really long fingers that curled, which are designed for living in trees. And so they said it's not in line with the evolutionary story. And the most recent one is a fossil find, again, where they got about two-thirds of the skeleton, dating to 200 to 250,000 years ago. The brain size is one quarter that of a human being, about the same as that for a chimpanzee. And so Instead of the brain getting bigger and bigger, you see the brain size going up, then down, up, then down. Again, counter to what the evolutionary models uh, would predict. The first one, how far back? Uh, I hate to say, because I can't quite remember all the details. So I'm encouraging Sue uh, to write some blogs for us. Because we have a visiting scholar blog now, and I'm asking her to write a blog on that to very point. Tell us about the... Uh, historical sequence of these bipedal primates, but I'm also asking her to write a blog on the dating. Because uh, it's something we've been wanting to do at Reasons to Believe, just noting in the literature that people put a lot of confidence on the dates for when these different bipedal primates existed and the tools that they found. And uh, she was making a reference how, and this is in the published literature, how they found this new site in South Africa uh, with these relatively advanced stone tools, and uh, they were publishing a date of 80 to 88,000 years, uh, but it's a thorium-uranium dating method where they basically look at the ratio of uranium to thorium. It's filled with systematic assumptions that are not acknowledged in the research papers. And she said, one of my colleagues said this, uh, not a believer, said, I think a better date is 45,000 years. And so just talking to Sue, says, okay, if you take all the systematics in effect, what is the range of possible dates? She said, well, something between 5,000 and 100,000 years. And I said, well, what I've written in my book is that 
The best scientific date we got for the origin of humanity is 150,000 years ago, plus or minus 150,000 years. <laughs> and she says, well, I would agree with that. That's, that's, that's about the, where it is. And the interesting thing is we actually get a more accurate date from the Bible than we do from the science. And it's all based on the fact uh, that the only radiometric tool we have uh, for dating humanity that isn't fraught with uh, huge systematic errors is radiocarbon dating. And uh, there are subtle errors there, but it's such that it's not uh, big, which means that we can reliably document uh, human finds back to about 35 to 40,000 years. Once you get earlier than that, you're dealing with things like thermal luminescence, optical luminescence, uranium thorium ratios, uh, where it could literally be off by a factor 10 or 20 times. But what she was talking about is on the literature, they always try to push the error bar to the most distant back point. And uh, that gives people the wrong impression. Yeah? Uh, I was able to talk to Sue as well. And could you speak to the interbreeding issue just for a brief she, she gave me really good evidence that the evidence for interbreeding between us and the Anacons is very slim, if at all. And I was wondering if you could address that. Well, I could. And Sue's a real expert on this. So that'd be, I'm hoping she can. I got lots of articles I want Sue to write. Right. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but um, when you read the scientific literature, it's like there's, they, they write about it as if we got undeniable evidence that early humans bred with Neanderthals. And it's based on a paper uh, published by 11 uh, anthropologists, physical anthropologists, and basically what the paper says is that, number one, there's about a 1% difference between human DNA and Neanderthal DNA. Now keep in mind that we only can compare about two-thirds of the genome of the Neanderthal to the human. So there's a big chunk that's missing. And it could be bigger than 1%, but what they said is a 1% difference is huge. It's so big, there's no doubt that they're distinct species. And hey, after all, 26% of our DNA is identical to daffodils. So, um, and, you know, obviously, a lot of our DNA is repeated in all species of life because a lot of our DNA is basically telling uh, what proteins the body needs to make and how they're to function. And for a lot, you know, it's universal across life that we use uh, similar uh, uh, proteins. In other words, we're made from the same dust. Well, the whole point is God's going to repeat an optimal design. In other words, if there's a protein function that works for us, that's optimized, it's going to work for daffodils just as well. And so all life forms have certain needs, so we should expect significant similarity. But the second point of uh, uh, that is that the paper was basically saying, we do see a slight more uh, similarity between Neanderthal DNA and that of Europeans, Asians, and South Pacific Islanders in that order. Uh, and then we do with Sub-Saharan Africans. So that was basically their whole point. We know the Neanderthals lived in the area of Europe and Asia, uh, at least Western Asia, and uh, therefore the fact that we see a greater DNA uh, similarity uh, with these Europeans and Asians and we do as Sub-Saharan Africans, basically they interpret that as a signal that they must have interbred, that the Sub-Saharan Africans didn't interbreed, whereas the Europeans and the Asians did. Uh, but here's the problem. When you look at the list of the 11 cultural anthropologists that published the paper, uh, there, I forget exactly the breakdown, but I do know that there were more Europeans than Asians and more Asians than Pacific Islanders, and there were no Sub-Saharan Africans. And so when that paper was published, I w wrote a blog basically saying, uh, you know, this is in a physics journal or an astronomy journal, the uh, immediate demand is, let's repeat this whole experiment using different Neanderthal DNA, where the only people that do the work are Sub-Saharan African cultural uh, or p physical <coughs> anthropologists. Uh, but that has not been done. And so it's still just that one paper uh, making uh, that point. And so it's like before we really give this total credence, 
let's at least repeat it. And it, when I, if you actually read the paper, the 11 authors said we did everything we could uh, to make sure we didn't contaminate the Neanderthal DNA. But we did come into contact with it, and we can't deny the possibility that the signal is contamination. The other thing they've said in the paper is uh, the signal that we got is a very weak signal. We only see it in the uh, Y chromosome. We don't see it in the mitochondrial DNA. And the fact that we only see it in the Y chromosome and not in the mitochondrial DNA, they concluded, they said, if this is actually a signal of interbreeding between Neanderthals and humans, then we're looking at sexual contact between Neanderthals and humans that's way below the level of sexual contact today between humans and apes. You know, and that's not very high, but they're basically saying it's even lower uh, for, so, uh, and as uh, Fuzz Rana says, you know, we humans have been sinners for a long time. This is not at all surprising. So, uh, but then there's been some uh, papers published about we're not even sure that humans uh, came in significant contact with these Neanderthals. But yeah, Sue is right. If you look at the published literature, they're looking at basically this is a done deal. There's no doubt that this actually happened. And her point is there's lots of reasons for doubt. Now, what about the lifespan of Neanderthals and bipedal primates? Do we have any clue? The lifespan? Well, we got a clue how long they existed on the face of the earth in terms of how long no, individuals like, lived. Did they live to be 900 years old? Well, we do know that uh, Neanderthals had a longer time between being born and being adult uh, than previous uh, bipedal primates. And I'm trying to remember the figure, I think it's on the order of like eight years, but it's a whole lot shorter than what it is for us human beings. For humans, it's 25 years. That's for women, uh, pardon me, men. Women, they become mature by 24 years. So. I thought there was subsequent evidence to that original that sort of reconfirmed the Neanderthal human. Yeah, the uh, subsequent plant. paper is based on the fact that they also saw this signal in what are called the Denisovans. The Denisovans are a bipedal primate uh, in the, that they found in the Western uh, <coughs> Siberia. And uh, there's a debate going on now. Are the Denisovans just basically Neanderthals or are they a separate species? But likewise, they found that their DNA appeared to have a little more affinity with Europeans and Asians than Sub-Saharan Africans. But again, if you look at the authors, there are no Sub-Saharan uh, authors. And incidentally, I don't mean people who happen to be living in Sub-Saharan Africa today. I mean by ethnic descent. In other words, uh, you know, black uh, African uh, individuals. Because, you know, after all, Sue Dykes is white, but she's got her degree in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So, yeah. And so I would agree with Sue. It's still an open question. Uh, but I also wrote an article making the point, even if this proves to be real, it doesn't impact the image of God because of how incredibly weak the signal is. These would be isolated incidents. Uh, this wasn't a pattern. Uh, as the original paper pointed out, we're looking at a uh, contact that's way below the bestiality that we see today between humans and apes. Scott, you had a Real question? Quick, um, this is off topic a little bit, but it's getting back to the dating of Adam and Eve. Do we have physical evidence at all about the local flood, the Mesopotamian plain, anything that can date that? Anything that can date the flood of Noah? Yeah. Uh, no. Uh, I write about that in Navigating Genesis, that given how far back in time the flood of Noah must have happened, uh, and how short in duration the flood was, we would anticipate there would be no geological evidence remaining at this point. Now, if you go to the area of the Persian Gulf and Mesopotamia, you actually see geological evidence for six floodplains, but none of them are Noah's flood. And uh, to get a significant floodplain deposit, the flood has to last a long time. Uh, the flood of Noah was just 13 months. And uh, a 13-month flood uh, isn't going to leave you discoverable evidence uh, tens of thousands of years later. 
And what I wrote in Navigating Genesis, I mean, one example of that, the Mississippi Valley was flooded 50 feet deep for four months. And this was, all, this was less than 30 years ago. Today, we have no geological evidence of that flood. And so, to expect something 30, 40,000 years later, where it's only 13 months, you wouldn't expect to find any evidence of that. Now, having said that, there is a geologist who's published a paper where he says, I think there is some evidence. He's basically referring uh, to a berm and the Gulf of Hormuz. I mean, again, I wish I could show you a map here. Uh, but if you look at the Persian Gulf, the mouth of the Persian Gulf is, you've got this narrow strait, um, and basically you can see evidence uh, that there was a berm there. And his whole point is, everybody know what I'm talking about with a berm? It's basically kind of like a, a ridge, and basically he's hypothesizing in the paper that there was a ridge that actually blocked Indian Ocean water from coming into the Persian Gulf. And he, like me, uh, puts the time of the flood uh, during the last ice age. And during the last ice age, you got sea levels 330 feet lower than they are today, which means virtually the entire Persian Gulf was dry land. At this point, there was actually a berm at the Gulf of Hormuz that would prevent uh, Indian Ocean water. And his theory is that uh, there was some kind of big tectonic event that broke the berm and there was this huge rush of Indian Ocean water into the Persian Gulf and uh, into Mesopotamia, plus lots of rain coming down, lots of snow and ice being melted off the mountains, because after all, this is during the last ice age, and he says, that's basically the flood. But that's the limit of the geological evidence we have, and it's not definitive. Uh, but it dates to about the right time. I mean, we know the flood had to be during the last ice age, uh, just to explain how long it took for the waters uh, to recede. It took seven and a half months for the waters to recede. For it to take that long, there's got to be lots of melting snow and ice. And that melting snow and ice doesn't exist today in that region because we're in a warm interglacial. And incidentally, that big flood in the Mississippi Valley, that's when we had a record snow melt. And it's because of that record snow melt that water accumulated 50 feet high in the Mississippi Valley. Because people say, well, doesn't water flow out to the ocean? Yeah, the water that flowed out uh, was not keeping pace where the water was coming in from melting snow off the mountains of North America. Same scenario uh, for the flood of Noah. Yes, there was water rushing out into the Indian Ocean, but it was being replaced at a more rapid rate from the melting of snow and ice at that time. Oh, five minutes to noon. Five minutes to noon, and I haven't even got into the book of Isaiah yet. Or I'm going to hold your question. Okay, because uh, I am going to stay around and handle questions, but yeah, we've got to make some progress here in the book of Isaiah. And last week, we got derailed into a subject of what the Bible says about death. And I mentioned we've actually got this little sheet. Uh, it's right here, called God's Mercy and Death, where we categorize death into four different categories. The young righteous dying, uh, the young old dying, uh, the uh, wicked and young dying, and the wicked old dying, and then some general verses on how God shows us mercy and death. I got enough copies here for all of you. So uh, incidentally, as I mentioned last week, uh, if you ever at a funeral or ever talking to somebody just like you did that's uh, close to death, Often what I do is say, just read these scripture passages. Notice that they're without any commentary. It's just the scriptures. And so just encouraging people, read what the text says about that. And I have lots of people that I've done that with that are close to death. And they told me just how extremely comforting it is to read these scripture passages and to read them all at once. So, uh, and then, we are going through the book of Isaiah. And we're going through it, uh, looking at all the issues that pertain to creation and the science and the nature of God. And these are the study questions. I've handed out 300 copies of this in the past, but I hear some of you have lost those. So hey, we got them back again. So if you don't have the questions, let's get these passed out. Gary, may I have you have pass them out? And then last week, I also promised that these passages that we've written out to deal with question number one, 
And question number one, what does the book of Isaiah say about the beginning of the universe? And the book of Isaiah says more about the universe, the creation of the universe, than any other book of the Bible. And what I've done for you is actually type up all these uh, scripture passages. Now we hand this out, it's two pages, but it's already collated. Just take the top two pages and pass it on. I didn't bother to staple these. Uh, didn't have time to do that this morning. But yeah, this is literally all the passages. And I did this because I wasn't sure I was going to be able to use a projector uh, this morning. We do have this one working. But this way you can actually read it for yourself. <coughs> and the last several weeks, we've gotten through about half of these scripture texts. And we're now on Isaiah 42, verse 5. But yeah, you got it right there in front of you. It's all well in the rest of the passages. And hey... I'd encourage you, sometime between this week and next week, actually sit down and read through all these passages about what Isaiah says about the creation of the universe. Uh, read them in one sitting, and hey, you can read them in one minute. It's not that hard to do. So take a minute out of your week and uh, just read through all the passages at once, because I want you to be able to integrate what all these texts are saying about the creation of the universe. But yeah, for those of you who are new, we're actually going through these passages one at a time where I ask you exactly what is this text saying about the universe and about God's means of creating the universe and why he creates the universe. And we finished with this one last week, basically making the point, and I'm now down to just two and a half minutes. Uh, this is what God the Lord says. He who created the heavens and stretched them out, referring to the universe, who spread out the earth, and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it, and spirit to those who walk upon it. And what we concluded last week after about 30 minutes of discussion, this text is basically saying, number one, God created the entire universe. He's responsible for all of it. He expands the universe, stretches out the universe, expands it at just the right rate so that we can live in it. He built up earth so it would teem with life, and not just with physical life, but soulish life and spiritual life. He talks about giving breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it, making the point that God designed the entire universe, earth and all of its life, for the express purpose of introducing beings, namely as human beings, who are physical, soulish, and spiritual. Everything that God creates is for the purpose of making possible uh, the introduction of us human beings. And that's basically what I wrote about an improbable planet, that literally every component of the universe, every component of the Earth, every historical event in the Earth and universe is designed to make possible the redemption of billions of human beings. That's where we ended up last week. I'm now down to a minute, okay? <laughs> this is where we're going, I'm probably a little over, but let me uh, finish with this, and then I'll let you go uh, to the meeting. It'll take them a minute to get things sorted out there anyway. Isaiah 43, verses 10 to 11. You are my witnesses. This is the Lord's declaration. And my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. No God was formed before me, and there is none after me. I am Yahweh, and there is no Savior but me. And I mentioned uh, that this is actually a text. The first text we're looking at that introduces the doctrine of the Trinity. And of all the books of the Old Testament, that of all the books of the entire Bible, <coughs> it's the book of Isaiah that's the most extensive and specific on the doctrine of the Trinity. You know, we had a couple of Jews attending this class uh, a couple of years ago, and they made the point that in Judaism, there are texts in the book of Jeremiah that are never studied. They avoid these texts that deal with the doctrine of the Trinity. But this is one of those texts. And we included this one because basically God creates the universe through his servant. And so notice this text here is talking about God, it's talking about Yahweh, and mentions a second person, the Savior, uh, the servant. There is no other Savior but me. And who is this Savior? So this is kind of introducing the doctrine of the Trinity. And that's a study question I'm going to leave for you for next week. How can we take this text? And basically what you need to do is kind of figure, okay, 
Where else in Isaiah does it talk about the servant as being distinct in personality from God? And likewise with the Savior. And what's interesting is you go through these texts, it identifies that the Creator and the Savior are one and the same. But notice this text is introducing uh, two separate beings here. And then there is only one God, one Creator, one Savior. How can God both be Creator and Savior? And how God can be the servant unless there's at least two persons in the Godhead. And we get later in the book of Isaiah, it's going to talk about the Holy Spirit. So with that, let me close a brief word of prayer. I encourage you to, to go to the meeting, but I'll hang around and field questions afterwards uh, for as long as you wish to do that. And please uh, jump ahead and look at the other texts. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for your servant Isaiah, Lord, for giving us such a long life under four different kings. And Lord, the way you communicated to us uh, through him about some of the most important doctrines of who you're about and what you're going to do and why you do uh, create the way you do. So Lord, I pray that you give us wisdom and grace and humility as we look at these texts. And Father, may you equip us to be more effective in sharing our faith with individuals that we meet. Individuals uh, like Mike talked about where he just had these incredible divine encounters. Lord, I pray that you bless us with those encounters and we have those encounters. Give us the gentleness and respect the wisdom and the words uh, that we can communicate the reasons for our hope within us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.